Okay, so now we're going to rigorously def derive the Leibniz rule using the um, using the uh, second fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so if we want to take the derivative with respect to time of this integral x1 uh, of t to x2 of t, uh, f of x, which depends also on time, uh, dx, uh, then that is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of the integral of x2 of t plus h, uh, x1 of t plus h, of f of x uh, t plus h, dx, minus the integral from x1 of t to x2 of t, uh, f of x at t, dx, all divided by h. OK, um, so now what we do is we apply the uh, second fundamental theorem of calculus, which tells us that, the li that these integrals are equal to the antiderivatives evaluated at, um, at the two endpoints. So it is equal to the limit as h approaches 0. So let uh, big F of xt uh, denote uh, the function uh, the basically, I want it to be the antiderivative of little f of x at t, um, where we dif where we're anti differentiating with respect to x. So I want del del x of big f of x t to be equal to little f of x t, basically. So uh, from that, I can now say uh, the antiderivative of this is big f of x of t plus h, so evaluate it at the end point, so we put in x2 of t plus h, um, and then we have t plus h minus big F x1 of t plus h at t plus h. Uh, and then what we do is we subtract off um, f of x2 at t of t, um, and we'll, well, we need to subtract off the um, the value of this, which is uh, f of x, well, it would be big F of x, sorry, big F of x, the antiderivative, uh, evaluated at x2 of t, minus big F evaluated at x1 of t, uh, t, uh, and then all of that subtracted, and all of this divided by h. Okay, so now I'll split it up into limit as h approaches 0, and remember that the sum of uh, the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. So we can split it up into limit as or h approaches zero of well, which terms will look as though we should put them together? It looks as though we should put this term with this term and this term with this term. Okay, so f of x two t plus h uh, t plus h minus f uh, of x two evaluated at t t uh, divided by h uh, and then we've got minus oh well okay so that limit there and then we've got minus um, and I've run out of paper just have a back okay so basically what I'm doing uh, just to explain what I'm going to do I'm gathering this term and this term together and dividing it by h because this looks like a derivative very much so and we're gathering this term with this term over h because that looks like a derivative too so what we're going to get is to rewrite it all out, we're going to get the limit as h approaches 0 of big F of x2 t plus h, uh, evaluated at t plus h, I believe, and I'll have to check that this is all right afterwards, x2 evaluated at t, t, and then we've divided that by h, and then we've got subtract off the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x1 of t, uh, oh, t plus h, it should be, I'm sure. Um, t plus h minus f of x1 evaluated at t, t, all over h as well. Okay, so uh, let's just check that that is right. It looks right. Yep, I think that is right. Okay, so now we have to, we remember that uh, big F of xt, if we differentiate that with respect to x, then that is equal to little f of xt. Now we need to ask ourselves, what is this? Because what we have done effectively is we've taken big f of xt and we've substituted in 
x2 of t. So we've substituted this, we've made this a function of t. So effectively what we've done is the equivalent of, in multivariable calculus, if you think about having, a, well it is multivariable calculus, so I can say exactly what we've done. Uh, we've got, uh, we had a function x here, we had a function t here, we've got some surface here, which is uh, big F of xt, let's say. Uh, and basically, what we have done is we've said x is now a function of t. So we've said, let's make a curve here. Uh, and this is x, let's say this is x2 of t. So this is the curve, x2 of t. So we've said x is now a function of t. And what we've ended up with is saying, OK, we've now said x is a function of t. So what was the value of big F of xt along this curve? And that's what we've now got. Uh, we've now got uh, this all, it, the whole thing is now a function of time because uh, once you know what the time is, uh, it tells you exactly what the x is, and then once you know what x and t are, you know what big F is, and that's effectively what we've done here. And we're now saying, what is the derivative of this overall function of time with respect to time? Okay, um, so what is this, basically? Well, we can use the chain rule here. We can say, uh, we can ask um, we can say how much is, for a change in x and a change in y, uh, and a change in time, for a change in x and for a change in time, we know what the change in big F is going to be because um, we know that big F uh, differentiates with, res uh, with respect to x to make little f. So we can do the partial derivatives of that. And then if we just factor in the fact that, you know, it's going to go along this line. So if we can work out what this little vector is, then we can work out what the derivative of this bigger function is. So we're going to apply the chain rule, basically. OK, so uh, we apply the chain rule and say that the um, if we want to differentiate with respect to time, this thing, what we need to do is differentiate it with respect to x and times it by how much x is going to change with respect to time. So we need to know how much dx dt is. And then we're going to add on to it how much f changes just with respect to time. So basically, I'm saying, remember what I'm, I'm, I'm going to review the whole argument again, so in case we haven't got it. Um, so we've said, here is our variable time. I've now said we've got some path, x2, as a function of time. Uh, so x is now determined as a function of time. We're throwing away the rest of the domain, basically. We're saying we're not interested in a point over here. We're only interested in the points along this line. And that is a function of time. So time is mapped onto this path uh, in a bijection. And then what we do is we say, what was the value of big F of xt on the points along this path? And therefore, we can ascribe a value of big F of xt uh, to each of these time values. And that's what we've done up here. These are This is a function just of time now. And we're now saying, what's the derivative of this with respect to time is effectively what we've got here. And for here, we've got the exact same thing, just with a different path x1 of t. Um, and what we're saying is, how do we work that out? Well, when we change time, we're changing time a little bit, and then we're changing x a little bit. And then once we know how much we're changing x by, and how much we're changing time by, uh, we can work out how much um, overall the big F must change, and it's given by this chain rule. The reason there isn't a dt dt there is because that's just one, because the change in time for a change in time, it, the ratio between it is the same, whereas the change in x with respect to the change in time, the ratio between them might differ. It might not be one. So if, of course, it was a straight line, if it was the line x2 of t is equal to t, then this would be 1, because it, the ratio would be the same. If you have the um, ratio would be 1. You change time by a tiny amount, and the amount you change x by would be exactly the same. OK, so now we've done that. Um, so what is uh, the derivative? So if we want to work out what the derivative of, OK, so that me show it to you. If we want to work out what this derivative is, what the derivative of this function is with respect to time, we need to know what is the derivative with respect to f, uh, what is the derivative of big F with respect to x, evaluated at that appropriate point. So we know that the derivative of big F with respect to x is little f, and we want to evaluate it at the correct point, and that point is x2 of t, t. So make sure that you understand why I've put that x2 there, because we're asking, what is the derivative of f with respect to x at this point? And this point is x2 of t, t. 
Okay, so that's why we've done that. And then we're asking how much does x change for a change in time? Well, this path was x2 of t, so we can stick in uh, dx2 dt there. Okay, and you should be noticing that that looks like a term that we have in the Leibniz rule. Okay, so, and then we do this bit here, df dt. That's a bit more awkward. What is df dt? f was the antiderivative of uh, little f with respect to time, or with respect to x rather, and we're now differentiating it with respect to time. So we'll leave that term for a while, so we'll just leave that. Uh, again, note where it's being evaluated at though. It's being evaluated at x2 of t uh, and t. So we're evaluating what is the change in big F of x um, as a function of x and time, or partial derivative of it with respect to time at that point. So remember that it's at that point, because um, just writing this derivative means nothing. It needs to, you need to tell me where you're evaluating it at. So it's being evaluated there. Okay, and now we're subtracting off this other derivative here, which is the derivative with respect to x1. So it's exactly the same thing, just by symmetry. So um, the minus f of x1 t, uh, t dx1 dt, and then minus del f del t, uh, evaluated at x1 t t. Okay, uh, so remember something here. Remember that big F of x uh, is the antiderivative of little f. Evaluate um, the antiderivative of little f um, uh, with respect to x, and that the uh, taking the antiderivative with respect to x and differentiating with respect to time commute. So we could view this as um, we could view this as we differentiate little f with respect to time and then take the antiderivative. So that's important because then we've got the antiderivative of little f with respect to time evaluated at x two t um, at t minus the antiderivative with respect uh, to x of d f d little f dt. Um, or evaluated at x1 of t. And then we can just apply the second fundamental theorem of calculus to say, oh look, this looks exactly like an integral because it's the antiderivative evaluated at one point, take away the antiderivative evaluated at another point. So it's the antiderivative, uh, so it's the integral of del little f del t. And where are we evaluating at? We're evaluating it at x1 of t to x2 of t uh, dx. So that is what we are applying there, is the second fundamental theorem of calculus. We're saying we have the antiderivative evaluated at between, evaluated at the antiderivative of this function here, little f. This is our little f here. Uh, so we're saying that this is the antiderivative of del f del t, where f is the little f, uh, evaluated at x2 of t, uh, subtract uh, this um, at this um, antiderivative of del little f del t uh, evaluated at x1 of t. So if we integrate uh, this function along there, then um, we will, and remember this is a function of x and time. So you might be wondering where this, this other bit's gone. Where have we used this information? Well, we've used that information in the fact that this is a derivative with respect to x and time. So, um, th and this is just a derivative with respect to x. So the time bit will sort of be independent of the x bit. So there's where this time constraint goes into this. So basically, that uh, is how you get the Leibniz rule. If you put that minus that, plus this, all together you get back the Leibniz rule which we derived in the previous video using intuitive, intuitive methods. Uh, this is completely rigorous by the way, what we've done. Uh, well, actually maybe it's not. Maybe some of these arguments over here weren't rigorous. But in principle what we've done is we've just used the second fundamental theorem of calculus which is proven uh, for both the Riemann and Lebesgue integrals. Um, so all the hard work went into proving those. And then when we, we could just apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. I suppose, yes, I haven't proven this at all to you. Uh, and I haven't proven that the antiderivative commute of with respect to x commutes with the derivative with respect to time. And this picture isn't probably rigorous, you know. But it's a nice intuitive, um, r uh, intuitive way to derive it. A, sec an intu a second intuitive way to derive it. Del f del t uh, dx evaluated at x1 of t, x2 
x2 of d. And it's nice confirmation that, you know, we used these two separate approaches to deriving this and got the same result.